there we go. I just had to give my notification to you all that this is now being recorded. Um, so yeah, so here we are today at the 2021 safety seminar for our tandem instructors. I'm going to be pleased to introduce Erica Dufour Lefrancois. Uh, Erica made her start as a skydiver at a small D Cessna DZ in 2005 on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada. She went on to become a tandem instructor in 2008 and attended the UPT Sigma Vector Tandem Examiner course with Jay Stokes in 2010. Erica has since produced countless tandem instructors worldwide. When Erica is not doing or teaching tandems, her preferred discipline is canopy piloting. As a new mom, Erica feels that her time as a competitive canopy pilot is likely behind her. However, she is still very passionate about canopy flight and sharing the importance of good canopy skills to students, experienced jumpers, and tandem instructors alike. She is committed to teaching and empowering skydivers to take charge of safety in this sport. So without further delay, um, Erica, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Allison. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, near and far. Great to see some familiar faces as well as so many people joining from all over the world. Uh, so to just give you a bit of a scope of uh, my intention for this presentation today. Uh, I would like to keep it as brief as possible. I know there are a lot of different time zones involved in today's presentation of this material. And so I'd like people that are either needing to leave for work or people that need to go to sleep for work tomorrow to be able to get as much out of this uh, in a shortest period of time as possible. So my aim is to have about 90 minutes maximum of more of a presentation. I'd love to open it up to some discussion, which we'll try doing at the end of each logical section time dependent so if it's getting a bit out of hand I, again I really want people to get everything that I can out of that 90 minute uh, timeline and um, and based on that we'll see how much discussion we can involve um, Allison is going to mute everybody uh, now so that you'll really only be able to to hear me I that sort of brings me into the, the next pieces of housekeeping for the presentation. Uh, if you have a piece that you want covered in a bit more depth, uh, if you have a probing question to ask, then you can ask it in the forum to everyone. Um, Nick Byers, uh, who is on here and has already been uh, kind of in the chat, uh, he's shared a PDF of the presentation. Uh, he's available for you to ask questions to directly. I'm not monitoring the chat in any way uh, because I'm too busy talking. And so if you have any questions, please direct them to Nick Byers. So I'm, he's going to just give a shout out right now. He's going to just write a note to indicate to, that you can send messages to him uh, and he'll direct them to me if they need to be addressed immediately. Uh, and if not, we can either do them at the end of the section. And if there are some questions that we just don't have enough time to get to uh, in today's presentation, then we would potentially you know, make a document uh, with some written answers that we can share uh, after this presentation. So today's presentation is going to be a concise review of emergency procedures. These emergency procedures come directly from the Sigma Tandem Manual, which can be found at the UPT website. Uh, I highly encourage you to review it um, annually. If you can only review part of it, the emergency procedures section is only 10 pages long. It's about page 100 to 110. Um, and while I'm going to cover the main points that need to be covered for emergency procedures, I can't do it all in an hour and a half. The other piece that will be lacking is whether you actually really knew the answer to the emergency procedure versus um, hearing it from my voice and going, yeah, that, that makes sense. Hearing it and agreeing versus actually knowing the answer are very different things. So I would encourage you after we've done this, uh, you can use the, the document that is being shared. It's going to be shared on the Sigma Tandem resource uh, page on Facebook uh, as well so that you can download that. You can keep it. It's a good resource to be able to cover a, a majority of the emergency procedures without having to look at them in, in the manual itself uh, with the written explanations. I also just want to say that um, while 
there are sometimes disagreements on how emergencies should be dealt with. Uh, we're not really going to be discussing them in tonight's forum. We're going to talk about the why uh, and potentially the how certain emergency procedures are dealt with, um, but this isn't going to be the forum for discussion around uh, changes to the way that emergency procedures are done. I'm just going to be going over how they are meant to be conducted based on the manufacturer that I'm rated with, which is um, Vector, Vector Sigma uh, with Vector. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for being involved. I'm going to start things off right away um, by moving into the first section I'm going to cover before emergency procedures are just a couple of the advisories uh, that came out. So there are three advisories that are posted on the, the website. So you can see those at uptvector.com. And I would recommend that uh, you have a look uh, at that website on a, on a semi-regular basis just to see if there's any new communications coming out. They're not really common. Right now, there are three. Uh, there are three current possible advisories that you would read. One of them is from 2012 relating to the Y modification. So that one, I think everybody in the industry has already adjusted to, uh, which is great. Um, the other two I'm going to talk about right now briefly before we talk about emergency procedures. So the first is a reminder of the important altitudes that we're meant to adhere to as uh, UPT rated Sigma tandem instructors. Uh, and so to start those from the top, kind of working our way down, uh, the minimum exit altitude for a tandem should be 7,500 feet. What this means for you, is that if you get in an airplane and, and you get up to a 7,000 foot cloud ceiling, that's not an emergency situation. That's not an exitable altitude. Uh, you are to descend with the aircraft uh, and try again, just the same as you would if you climbed and only got to 3,000 feet of cloud ceiling. So 7,500 feet is our minimum exit altitude as tandem instructors. Uh, and we should be adhering to that as the sort of high, one of the altitudes that's listed. The next important altitude to note is 4,000 feet, and that's the minimum open canopy altitude. So they specify the altitude by which you need to have a fully inflated main parachute, rather than listing what altitude you need to execute deployment or release the drogue. And that's because there is a lot of variation in packing styles and equipment that can be used. If you don't know the equipment at a drop zone, then aim a bit high. At this point, uh, the rule has been around for a while and people are adjusting and, and pulling higher, usually between five and 6,000 feet to have a fully open parachute by 4,000 feet. And then our next and last listed altitude that's designated by the manufacturer is your decision altitude, also known as a hard deck. And that's 3,000 feet. So what that altitude means to you as a skydiver is um, to me quite empowering. I love to think as the, of the decision altitude of the hard deck in a tandem scenario as me not having to make a decision because the manufacturer has made it for me. At 3000 feet, I need to have a parachute over my head that I deem safe to land. If I don't, I don't need to make any further decisions other than how do I get a parachute over my head that I know I can land. Um, and to me, the reason that's really important is because it can otherwise be kind of guilt inducing or difficult if you're at 3000 feet in line twists uh, for you to decide to cut away and deploy the reserve. But it's still a malfunction, no matter what, if you're looking up at 3000 feet without certainty that that's a good canopy, then Luckily, you don't need to make much more. Um, you don't have to use much more of your judgment because it's been dictated to you. So to reiterate those altitudes, 7,500 feet, minimum exit altitude, 4,000 feet, minimum fully open main parachute, and 3,000 feet is your minimum altitude by which you have a fully functioning parachute. You're making that decision at 3,000 feet to execute the deployment of a parachute that will work for you, uh, either keeping the one you have or getting uh, another parachute out. And the reason that it's really important to reiterate these altitudes is because when we get complacent and we decide to exit the airplane a little bit lower, deploy our parachute a little bit lower, 
or go a little bit lower than our hard deck, that's when uh, dangerous incidents uh, result. If we follow those outlined altitudes all the time, then we're going to get much closer to a zero incident uh, environment community of tandem skydiving. Uh, and then that moves into the second advisory. So that covers one of the advisories for tandem skydiving. The second advisory is relating to uh, a hand cam. So this one also came out in 2020 um, after an, an incident that occurred, um, which involved a hand cam hang up. And the advisory specifies, again, the requirements for doing hand cam, which is a minimum of 200 uh, hand or tandem skydives. And it also uh, just reminds people of the importance of practicing with that hand cam and what the requirements are. But the piece that's been added now that's new as of 2020 is that uh, the requirement for that hand cam to be able to be easily released. So specifically, it needs to be able to be released in one motion. So some drop zones have taken this uh, and gone ahead and installed some version on a hand cam mount of an, an easy one pull release, uh, similar to a three ring system. Uh, and that's great. That could end up becoming our future in the industry. They made it vague on purpose because what they really want is just to make sure that people are able to remove their hand cams in one fell swoop. So if you're flying something standard, not that uncommon to have to have your hand closed in order to keep the hand cam well secured. If you are able to open your hand and in one swoop release, release the Velcro um, so that your hand cam is no longer attached to your hand, that is still currently acceptable. So you don't need to adjust your hand cam unless you find that you cannot easily remove it. And I would recommend that you try that uh, before your next jump and have a friend that's applying pressure in different directions to ensure that if you have a hang up of some kind, that you are still, even with pressure from say a line entanglement, able to release your camera, okay? So that summarizes the two advisories that are currently on the Tandem uh, website, that's ubtvector.com. So if you uh, need to visit those, you can absolutely find any of them anytime you'd like. Um, I wanted to just, before I proceeded, make sure that I can get a thumbs up from somebody to make sure that um, everything that's happening with my video right now and the audio is, is reasonably good. So is there anybody that can, can tell me? Okay, great. All right, so we're gonna move into the actual emergency procedures. So if you want to care to have like a desktop, I know many of you are on like a phone type device or an iPad, then it, it's not gonna be as simple, but I did share a document so that you can follow along uh, with me as I go through these. What I've done is I've broken up the emergency procedures logically so that they're in chronological order from the time that you would start your skydive getting in the airplane all the way down to the landing. So it doesn't necessarily follow the exact same um, way that they're outlined in the Sigma manual. However, anything that we're talking about today, I'll specify um, there's just a couple that you won't find in the, the tandem manual. Everything else can be found. Since I do have a pretty wide audience of people that are here, um, I want to tell people that if you are listening to this material and you're finding that uh, a lot of it sounds kind of new, um, that you're a bit surprised by any of the answers, then please feel free to reach out uh, to either to myself, to somebody else that you feel uh, as a knowledgeable coach um, and do more practice because this is really just going to be the tip of the iceberg. If on the other hand, we're going through this and you know all these answers in advance and most of everything we're talking about sounds very redundant, yep, you've heard it, then congratulations and thank you. You're one of the TANM instructors that is um, in ensuring the safety of our sport by keeping up to date on your emergency procedures, which is really important and very close to my heart. So um, either way, the pretty wide audience here, so I'm going to be trying to keep it concise, uh, accurate, and uh, cover as much as I can in about the next, uh, in the next hour, roughly. All right. Uh, so to begin, before we get in the aircraft, I just want to remind everybody that we're going to make sure that we do an equipment check. We want to do a full equipment check every time we jump a parachute, even if we've jumped it multiple times that same day, um, because wear and tear on the equipment and, uh, and packing are things 
that need to be verified on every single jump. And we wanna make sure that we're not getting complacent with that one. Uh, once you've done a thorough gear check, assuming your passenger is all uh, fully trained and properly harnessed, those pieces aren't things that we have time to discuss in tonight's forum. Uh, so just moving into a proper handles check. So just making sure if you've been a long time since your last season, some of you may have made some skydives today with tandem passengers. Others might be a few months since we're, uh, we're winter here in Canada, just coming out of it. Uh, so just doing a proper handles check. So making sure that you're checking your drogue, then your primary, which should be on your left-hand side, secondary on the right-hand side, cut away okay your reserve and your rsl okay uh and doing that with equipment on all right it's, it's still good practice to do and understand and know where those handles are going to be uh, even when you're not wearing equipment but especially since uh the equipment we're wearing isn't specific to our bodies and tailored we also want to make sure that we're doing a, those handles checks with the equipment on uh, especially at the beginning of our seasons. So moving into the aircraft. So this next section, uh, I will be surprisingly vague about, uh, and I'll, I'll kind of get into that. At the end of this section, I'll try to open it up um, and either Allison or Nick can sort of help uh, to moderate a little bit of discussion if anybody has some questions or extra commentary. So the first one to cover a fairly stereotypical uh, progression for our emergency procedures, uh, an aircraft emergency uh, below 1500 feet. So for any of the aircraft emergencies, our pilot in command, the person that is flying the aircraft is the person that we are listening to. Uh, so whatever their response is, we're to listen to them. So hopefully in most scenarios below 1500 feet, uh, there's a safe landing place and the pilot will potentially have you uh, just stay with the aircraft and do what he needs to do. Have you move if necessary uh, in order to execute a safe landing of the aircraft. In this scenario where we're landing with the airplane, it's really important for you to be separate from your tandem passenger. So if you have gotten into the aircraft and automatically connected the lower connection points, then you're going to make sure to disconnect those so that the passenger and you are able to operate independently in the event where you have to exit the aircraft quickly on landing or if one of you becomes incapacitated. So making sure you're independent of your passenger and then making sure that you independently have your own seat belts. Uh, so you don't want to be sharing a seat belt with anybody else for that same reason, for independent uh, ability to, to navigate in the airplane. Uh, if you have helmets, then put them on. Uh, if your passenger has a soft shell helmet, uh, having them put it on is also a great extra precaution. And so that's if you're landing in the airplane below 1500 feet. Well, under a sort of more catastrophic scenario, uh, if for some reason you end up having to get out of the aircraft below 1500 feet because the pilot doesn't feel that he feels that your chances of survival are better while exiting the aircraft at that speed. This is where I'm going to be vague because I think you need to have a discussion that's specific to your drop zone under your circumstances, uh, trying to discuss how this will look for a twin otter that has 50% sport jumpers and 50% tandem instructors is going to look very different than it does from a Cessna 182 with two tandems. Uh, and so that's why I hesitate to talk too much in specifics. I will say that in the bottom line is to get as many connection points done up as you safely can and exit the aircraft on your reserve. Um, so what this will typically look like, hopefully, you, if you aren't doing it already, you should try to always, when you're hooking up your passengers in everyday normal occurrence, hook up the top left connector before you hook up the top right. If you're doing them both at the same time, great. But if you're only going to do one at a time, um, then let's make sure that it's the top left one rather than the top right. How do I make it not choppy? Okay, sorry, I'm just being told my video is choppy and I'm, I'm sorry about that. I will, is the audio okay? Okay, I'll try to maybe use less gesticulation so it's not as important. Um, but if you're connecting the top left snap before your top right snap, then you're developing the muscle memory of being able to connect that top left snap in an event of an emergency so that you can hold your passenger with your right arm 
exit and immediately deploy your reserve with the left. So that's assuming we're exiting and needing to get out very quickly and have a wing above our heads. So that brings us into the next section of aircraft emergencies, which is between 1,500 and 4,000 feet. So for between 1,500 and 4,000 feet, the emergency procedure will be the same as what we just discussed. It's very specific depending on what kind of aircraft you're exiting, what sort of terrain you're at, at your home drop zone. So I would highly encourage some specific conversations around the bonfire with other tandem instructors, with other sport jumpers for what it looks like in your circumstances if you have to get out between 1,500 and 4,000 feet. Uh, the, the basic premise is that we're going to connect as many connections as we safely and quickly can with our tandem passenger, and we're going to exit on reserve, okay? Um, but having some more conversations about what that looks like, uh, because trying to get out really, really quickly from a Cessna 182 is a lot different than getting out really quickly from uh, a pack or a twin otter, okay? And then the last one, aircraft emergency above 4,000 feet. Um, this one, again, outlined very specifically in the manual as being uh, connect all of the connection points with your tandem passenger uh, and then do a normal stable exit. Throw the drogue, check inflation, and then immediately release the drogue. Um, I would caution, however, that 4,000 feet is really, uh, that's, the minimum, right? We're supposed to be under a fully inflated main parachute at that altitude. And so ultimately, if you're getting it at 4,000 feet and you're in terrain, like I'm used to flying in where there are a lot of mountains and otherwise, if you're not certain of what terrain you'll be jumping out over at that altitude, then it to me would be feasible to, to get out on your reserve as well. Um, in some of that sort of gray area. As you get up higher than uh, with your comfort level, uh, getting out on the main is the prescribed standard operating procedure um, from the Sigma tandem manual. And then one of the last ones I've added for discussion here is just a hang up on, on aircraft. Um, so this one we don't tend to see as often reviewed as an emergency procedure. Uh, and that's okay, I think it mostly just warrants some discussion. So this would be one where uh, I would rec recommend that you have conversations with your chief pilot, or the pilot themselves. People that fly uh, jumpers can often, uh, specifically at smaller drop zones, be accumulating time. So they're not necessarily really experienced uh, pilots. That's not always the case. They're, we're very lucky in the industry to have lots of drop zones with very, very experienced pilots. Um, but it would be really great for me, I would want to know if uh, the pilot has some training around what to do if uh, somebody, it could be a tandem or otherwise, uh, is hung up on either the strut or if maybe a pilot shooter otherwise is hung up on the tail of the aircraft. Um, so knowing that there might be a hook knife available in a glove box is different in a Cessna aircraft than it is in a Twin Otter type aircraft. Okay, um, so I encourage you to have those conversations. Uh, the biggest piece relating to hangups with an aircraft are prevention. So just a healthy reminder that we want to make sure that we have good briefings with our passengers uh, so that they understand the approach to the door for exit, how to get ready for their exit from the airplane, what exactly you're doing, you should be comfortable and well prepared before you launch. Um, doing final checks of your equipment before you leave the aircraft, especially if you've had to scoot along the floor, making sure that that drogue hasn't come out so that it's going to have any chance of hanging up. And, uh, and then also making sure you've got a strong launch from the airplane with seatbelts disconnected uh, before you're exiting the airplane. Okay. Um, so at this point, I, I'm going to go ahead and see if there's anybody that has any questions or commentary that they want to add in, and that will give me a chance to have a little drink of water as well. So if Alice wants to take over for a moment and see if anybody's got any questions. Absolutely. And so for those of you who have not in this wonderful day and age but had a chance to be on Zoom, you do have a reactions uh, button. Most of you should at the bottom where you have an, uh, you can raise your hand. It's a little icon that shows a raise hand. Uh, if you do have a question and you'd like to raise your hand, um, 
please feel free to do so. If not, you can post in the chat as well and say, hey, I have a question. Make sure that you're posting it to everyone or myself or Nick. So I don't see anyone with questions. All right, well, Erica, back to you then. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take that to mean I've either covered the material miraculously well, um, or it's just really boring and there are no questions to be generated from it. Either way, uh, wasn't much of a break. So maybe you guys can come up with a question on the next round so that I can, you know, have a chance to eat a chocolate chip cookie or something. Um, okay, so moving into this next section, aircraft uh, is complete. So now we're gonna talk about uh, the free fall portion. So I just wanna specify that I've, I'm outlining this as free fall because we're not, not under the drogue yet, but it's a bit of a misnomer in the sense that I'll probably refer to drogue fall as free fall as well. The next section that we're going to talk about is just the piece that's between us exiting the aircraft and the drogue deployment. Okay, so that's the piece we're going to talk about right now. Um, so just to reiterate our handles check, we should be checking them um, before we get out of the airplane, especially a last check of the drogue before we exit. And then as we exit the airplane, hopefully nice and strong into the relative wind, throwing that drogue at full arm extension, and then looking over our shoulder to make sure it's inflated before then doing a complete handles check, primary, secondary, cutaway, reserve, RSL. And just a reminder that those should actually be very conscientious checks of those handles. Uh, you're not doing it just because you have to, you're doing it because you might actually need those handles and knowing their location uh, could be instrumental in the next minute of your life. Um, and so the, the verification of the drogue inflation is the piece that we add to our, our handles check on that one. So then moving into our free fall emergencies to so have this one numbered as number five on my checklist, uh, an unstable exit. Uh, so prevention is always what I like to look at first. So to prevent an unstable exit, we're going to be prepared ourselves and we're going to have our students well prepared. We're going to try to exit in the in a powerful orientation to the relative wind uh, without doing any additional maneuvers. Um, I don't really want to preach to everybody, so I'm just going to leave it at that, that um, that's what we should be trying to do as a tandem community is a strong exit into the relative wind. Having said that, if something happens, perhaps um, somebody's hand gets stuck on the door, otherwise the student grabs the door as they exit and it makes you rotate and you end up in an unstable configuration. You can spend up to 10 seconds attempting to clear uh, an unstable exit or attempting to correct an unstable exit. Um, so use the skills that you have as a skydiver. Uh, and if you're unable for some reason to maintain or get stable in that 10 seconds, uh, then you're going to immediately throw the drogue at that time. We don't want this to be a frequent occurrence. If you're a newer skydiver, it's going to be a bit more common for you to feel the effects of an unstable drogue throw, um, but hopefully they should be few and far between and really, really uncommon as you gain some experience as a tandem instructor. If you're finding that they're occurring, um, at all, really, as you've gained experience, then I would recommend that you reach out to somebody that you feel comfortable with um, for some pointers on what you could be doing differently to have stable drogue throws. Okay, but the bottom line is that if you have an unstable exit, you can spend up to 10 seconds trying to improve your circumstances. So getting stable, if you are not able to get stable in that 10 second period of time, then you're going to go ahead and throw the drogue and you're gonna make sure it doesn't happen on a regular basis, okay? Um, so then I'm gonna move right into the side spin. Uh, and this one again, isn't often, isn't touched on really, really frequently as an emergency procedure. I would call it more of a phenomenon than an emergency because they're so rare. So I'm gonna say that as a tandem instructor and an examiner, this is to me the most difficult emergency or phenomenon to teach. And that's because I don't have any experience with it. And I think that's the case for most of the people I've interacted with. The information that I have around it is probably 10th hand. You know, I've heard it from somebody who's heard it from somebody. 
it's very difficult to teach things that you don't actually see yourself or have close contact with. So I'm very grateful that we have things like the side spin video. I'm also really grateful that the side spin video is quite old, uh, which indicates that these kinds of occurrences are quite rare in today's um, tandem skydiving world. Having said that, um, I've come to the conclusion that uh, side spins are in a category for me with orgasms and migraines. So let me explain. Uh, if you were speaking to somebody who says, I think I might have had an orgasm, you are gonna know for certain that that person probably has not, because you just know when you've had one. And I can say from recent experience that migraines are similar. Anybody that thinks they may have had a migraine hasn't had a migraine. I expect that side spins are similar. I can't say that for sure. And I hope I never can find a conclusion to my, my guess. But my thought is that these are so rare uh, that when they do happen, you just know. So that's why we're gonna go over the very brief way to get out of a side spin so that if you do happen to be in one, then you'll go, holy crap, I'm in one. And you'll hopefully remember these, uh, this terminology. So I know that my video is being a little bit choppy right now, um, which might make the uh, visual cues that I have uh, a little bit less useful. So I'll just be sure not to move them around a bunch. Uh, but in short, a side spin tends to happen um, because of a propeller that's created with you and your passenger. So if you imagine that you're one of the bananas and the passenger is the other banana, uh, then if you get into this orientation and the wind is hitting you in just the wrong direction, uh, then you're now creating a propeller and this can get going very, very quickly. So the simplest thing to keep in mind is that what we need to do is no longer be a propeller. So what the tandem manual will tell you to do is to uh, basically get the student to stop de-arching and get, you need to personally stop arching so that each of those bodies are kind of coming into a straightened orientation. So to do this in the manual, it would be outlined for you to take the student's hands and kind of put them at their hips and scoop their legs to straighten them out. What I would say is that if you can't remember a whole lot, then mostly just remember to de-arch and do what you can to improve the passenger's body position where possible. It's important to remember that side spins, when they do happen, can accelerate at a very high rate of speed very quickly. And so if you find that you're not able to slow the acceleration uh, within just a couple of seconds, then you're gonna wanna make a decision between either throwing the drogue or deploying the reserve depending on which rotation you're in, what side is, is up. The other thing I like to point out, and I will say that this isn't specified in the manual, but centrifugal force, when it gets going, uh, it makes it very difficult for you to operate outside of the center of the spin. This means that it could be a lot easier physically for you to get to the reserve handle, which is closer to the center of that rotation than it is for you to reach outside of the rotation to get your hand on the drogue. Um, so to reiterate, side spins, luckily very rare. Uh, we can avoid them by having good presentation to the relative wind and by not hesitating uh, when we have an opportunity to throw the drogue in a stable configuration. If you do feel that you um, or having a side spin phenomenon, then you need to relax and try not to arch as hard as you can, because that might increase the propeller. Uh, you need to try to relax the student's position as much as possible into a more straightened orientation. And ultimately, you either need to throw the drogue or deploy the reserve, whichever side is up, or whichever one you actually are able to get to, okay? So that's the side spin. Um, and so I'm gonna move on from that one. I'm gonna take a quick drink of water here. The question was, uh, is it a factor of the side spin? Um, so there's just one quick question that I'm being posed was just, um, 
regarding whether loose uh, side connectors could be um, sort of a factor in the side spin. Um, and what I would say is that it might make a side spin worse if you happen to be in one, it might make it worse more quickly, but it isn't going to cause a side spin. Um, you may end up noticing that in the event or in the videos where there are side spins that happen, those lower connections end up being all the way out and loosened to the stops anyways, because of the force involved and those bodies being pulled apart. Uh, having those loosened isn't going to make your job as an instructor any easier because now you're further away from your passenger. Um, but if you didn't even have the lowers connected at all, and you and your passenger exited into a stable orientation, both arching and through the drogue, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't ultimately end up in a side spin uh, at a greater frequency because you didn't have the lower connections. So hopefully that sort of answers that, uh, that question. Uh, Nick, anything else has come up? Okay. Okay. Um, so moving on. So now if you happen to be looking at uh, the handout that I've given, I'm on number seven um, of the handout. So Nick is potentially going to have posted this again for people to be able to, to see and follow along if you want to. So I'm on number seven under the free fall section. Uh, student grabs your right arm. Uh, so if a student grabs your right arm, we've just exited the airplane. Uh, if they happen to grab your right arm, then you're not able to deploy the drogue. What I would say again from a prevention perspective is that a student should never be able to grab your arms on exit. I definitely understand that one of the exceptions is with the, the, the hand cam. At this point, we are presenting our left arm in a much more obvious configuration for them to be able to grab. Luckily, that doesn't affect uh, your drogue deployment hand, your right hand. And so for the most part, as far as prevention, if we steer uh, clear of having our hands available to the student. When they're in front of us, it's very difficult for them to reach back and, and somehow get our hands. If they have also been instructed to be in this orientation with their hands on their harness, holding on to their main lift web, uh, then they're a lot less likely to reach out and grab your hand if they're already holding something uh, for sort of comfort purposes. This is a good time to remind people that uh, we've moved in our sport in the last uh, decade or, or further from having hands crossed uh, with the student for their exit into uh, having hands on the main lift web, pushing the elbows kind of back. So the reason for that is because it promotes more of an arch. It also makes it a bit less likely for them to be able to reach across and grab your, your handles. So a couple of reasons for that. So, to reiterate, uh, prevention is key with having a student that grabs your right hand. Having said that, if you end up in the unfortunate scenario where somebody has uh, a grip on your right hand, uh, I would recommend using po positive language whenever possible to ask them to please put your hands on the harness, let go of my hand. We don't normally need to resort to kind of abusive behavior with, with passengers. They're not being malicious. They're just scared. So tell them what you need them to do. Um, before getting aggressive. And then you do have 10 seconds to, you know, deal with this. So that's a pretty long time in the skydive world. Uh, what I would say that I would do as a very last resort if I needed to would be to use my left hand to remove their goggles. I've never actually had to do this, um, but I know that any time I've had a tandem passenger whose goggles become dislodged or come off, it's very unpleasant for them and they immediately reach for their face. Uh, and so that will usually free up your hand to be able to deploy the drogue. If for some reason the death grip is so powerful, um, then we're going to end up having to deploy our reserve. Okay, so moving on to number eight, a hard pull to extract the drogue. Uh, so I'll probably stand up for this one just to make my body sort of a little bit more visible. Um, if we need to deal with a, a hard pull to extract the, the uh, the drogue, uh, what you want to keep in mind is that normally we instruct everybody to pull their pilot chutes or their drogues with their thumb down. The reason for that is because when we throw in this orientation, it's less likely to cause an entanglement with our, our arm. If we're not able to get the drogue out though, we're going to forego that small convenience and we're going to put our uh, elbow into the side of the rig 
We're gonna reach back so that we have a bit of a mechanical advantage and then we're gonna try pulling out. So the only downside to this is it does present your thumb in an upright position and might be more likely to have a, an entanglement, but it does give you the added benefit of being able to have a little bit of extra mechanical advantage um, with the pull of that, of that drogue. So with either of these scenarios, uh, with having the student grabbing your right hand or a hard pull to extract the drogue, if we find ourselves in a position where we simply cannot extract the drogue, so that's um, the next emergency procedure, can't deploy the drogue, um, then we're gonna need to go directly to our reserve parachute. Um, so we would generally spend a maximum of 10 seconds trying to resolve something uh, before we pull a de uh, either deploy our, our drogue if necessary in an unstable configuration or deploy the reserve. Now that is kind of the maximum. If you find yourself in a situation where you've tried a couple of times really hard to get the drogue out, you don't need to wait 10 seconds to execute your emergency procedure of deploying the, the reserve, okay? Okay, uh, moving on to number 10, uh, having a drogue bridle or a drogue canopy entangled with you. Um, so the prevention for this, where we see it most commonly, where I've seen it most commonly, are with uh, slightly newer instructors that get a bit timid about throwing the drogue parachute. Um, they think they're stable, they start executing the deployment of the drogue, and then they find themselves rotating slightly, they pause the deployment of their drogue, um, which ends up meaning they kind of just pull the drogue out rather than throwing the drogue. That's the most likely cause of a bridle or a drogue parachute entanglement with you or your passenger. So the prevention for this is that strong throw away from your body as far as you can. So even if you find that you've started a drogue deployment and sorry, a drogue throw um, and are no longer in the ideal configuration you thought you were in, proceed and throw it as hard as you can, okay? Uh, if you find yourself entangled, then spend up to 10 seconds trying to disentangle yourself or your passenger from that drogue parachute. Okay, so that might look like shaking a bit. It might look like grabbing at it from your student and throwing it away. Um, but you have up to 10 seconds. Uh, if you ultimately are just not getting any headway, uh, then you don't need to spend the full 10 seconds before going to your reserve parachute. No drogue, no main. Uh, so there's no other protocol except to go directly to a reserve. Okay. All right, this last one is one of my favorites. So if you know me at all, I really like to instruct the out of sequence deployment, uh, specifically to experienced jumpers. Um, I find that there's a really big gap in our community with the sort of continuing education around some of our emergency procedures. So the out of sequence deployment, when I talk about it right now, I'm gonna talk about it from the perspective of just a sport jumper because the procedure is the same and the error in our community is kind of stems from when we're early jumpers. When we become skydivers, we're generally taught that if it's a partial malfunction, so the container is open, then we're gonna cut away and we're gonna deploy the reserve. And we wanna keep it that simple and we should keep it that simple for new skydivers because it's otherwise a fairly overwhelming emergency. As experienced jumpers though, we can do better. And so that's where I really like to add the continuing education piece to this. So with some help from my friends, uh, I've developed a graphic uh, to show what the out of sequence deployment can look like if we don't sort of follow proper procedures. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, so that you guys can see this graphic. Um, if you can't see it because you're on sort of a call in or otherwise, uh, I'll share it other, I'll share it anyways, and I'll try to be very specific um, with what I'm talking about. So that if you're mostly only hearing me, uh, you still understand what I'm saying. So what we're looking at right now is just a depiction of a horseshoe malfunction or an out of sequence deployment. So we can see that it's called that because we have this big U shape, this horseshoe that goes from the bottom of the container at either our pilot chute or our drogue, and then it connects up to our risers. Um, 
So it's called an out of sequence deployment because normally the first step is to throw the pilot chute or the drogue. The second step is for the main container to open. In an out of sequence deployment, uh, step number two has happened before step number one. And so anytime we experience an out of sequence deployment, uh, we wanna try to correct that by engaging step number one. So we would try twice to either throw our pilot chute or throw our drogue chute into the wind to clear this. If not, then that's where the added steps can be really beneficial and improve our likelihood of a good reserve opening. So the diagram that I depict sort of shows that U-shaped um, malfunction. And what happens if we cut away is that there's not really a lot of force acting on our risers. So when we cut away, what we want is for our risers to go away, usually with a main parachute. But in this scenario, most of the time, there's not enough drag to pull away the risers. Most of the tension is actually at the bottom end, closer to where your pilot chute bridle is. Because the lines allow it to kind of be very fluid near your risers, so if you cut away and then just deploy your reserve, your risers will probably still stay seated. Your riser covers will probably still just be closed. That's why it's important for us to be able to clear that, clear the risers so that we move them. If you're looking at the diagram, then you kind of see that by disconnecting the RSL, cutting away and clearing our risers, we can now make space for our reserve. So to talk about this all in one fell swoop, if we end up in sequence. So we're gonna try twice to throw the pilot chute if we're a sport jumper or throw the drogue if we're a tandem instructor. In either scenario, your handle can sometimes have relocated because of the distortion in the main container from the bag being out of it. So if you're not able to locate the handle, you've tried twice, then you're going to move on to disconnecting the RSL, if you have one, uh, cutting away, clearing the risers. So this means physically putting your hands on the risers, pulling away the risers, and basically throwing them before de deploying your reserve. So uh, like I said, I love teaching this malfunction because I feel that most people don't know it intuitively. And I want you to know it just as well as you know your other emergency procedures. I also love that this is the end of this section. So it's a really great time to open up the floor to some questions. I'm gonna go ahead and leave this uh, up while we have some, some question answer, if there are any, um, specifically around this graphic or, um, or anything else that we've talked about so far. Hi guys. Uh, so I do have a question here, Erica, and it's just from uh, unknown name. I'm gonna ask, uh, the letter F here to unmute. I just ask you to unmute. Go ahead with Hi. your question. Hi, hello. Is, is, is that for me? It is. Yes, it is. Now, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Good evening for everyone. I just wanted to ask if the RSL is mandatory for everyone because um, I have seen that it complicates us in high speed malfunctions, like this one, for example, like in four or five high speed malfunctions, it's, um, it, it adds one step, one difficult step, that it is to um, uh, find that yellow tape, yellow tiny tape and disconnect it uh, pre previously to cut away and clear the risers and open our, our reserve. So, I was wondering, first of all, if it's mandatory to use it or if uh, at the discretion of the tandem master, and if we could, if we are able, if we are uh, approved to change it for the crystal ball that is easier to, to find. Thank you. 
Um, okay, great. So just uh, to summarize your question, and please feel free to send a message, like clarification back to, to Allison or, or otherwise to, to Nick, if, um, if I don't get the full breadth of it. But basically, you're asking if the RSL is mandatory. Um, and then you referred to the crystal ball, which they used to use um, on the sort of the vector systems. Uh, some some time ago. Uh, so the first part of the question is, are, is the RSL mandatory? And, and yes, it is. If I made it in any way sound like it, it wasn't, it's because I'm, I'm also kind of speaking to experienced jumpers. Uh, in the tandem world, yes, absolutely 100%. The RSL is necessary. Yeah, there is no option to um, sort of remove it. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why it's really important to do our handles checks uh, regularly, including one uh, when we're in drogue fall to double check that we can find the location of that yellow tab. Um, now, my, my second part of this question, we might have to, to reach out to, to Tom or otherwise. Uh, the crystal balls uh, were discontinued, uh, namely because of a couple of reasons, but they were, they were causing some injuries like some, because they were getting trapped under the risers um, and they would end up hurting quite a bit with your collarbone. I can speak to that. Um, but they also, because of the, the sort of the shape of them, they could actually sort of get lodged in the RSL itself or not in the RSL, sorry, the, the three ring itself. So whether you're still able to get that crystal ball or not, I, I think the answer is no. Um, but I, I am quite happy to make sure to, to come back to you with a more specific answer on that. If there's anybody in the chat that like just knows the answer to this, then please uh, feel free. Um, I know what I know and I also know what I don't know. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question. Uh, the piece that I will say relating to um, sort of the downsides with having an RSL uh, or like it's difficulty with the disconnection of it. Um, when the UPT outlines its standard operating procedures, they're very fact-based, they're statistics oriented, they're after gathering a lot of data. And so what we tend to see ourselves are individual experiences, right? We each have our own perceptions that are based on these experiences. Uh, but UPT isn't only looking at one or two people's experiences. They're looking at global experiences, a summary of a lot of data when they come up with these standard operating procedures, because ultimately they just want the sport to be as safe as possible with the, the least amount of liability as possible. And so if they say that the RSL is mandatory and it needs to be used at all times, that's because it is an improved safety measure, not just to a couple of people, but but overall, globally, the statistics represent that it's a safe measure to have. So hopefully that kind of helps a little bit. Allison, do we have anybody else? Any other questions? I, I don't see other, any other hands up. Uh, I, there was at one point, but then it went down. So I'm assuming that there was- This question was specifically about the other sequence deployment. Uh, okay, Gord has a question. I got to find him and ask him to unmute, sorry. Um, Gord, where are you? This could be fun. I don't have I don't have a full screen, so bear with me. We've got uh, quite a few of you on oh, here. Just a so Sorry, Erica. So if I understood that last question, I don't think he was asking about whether or not RSLs are mandatory or not. I think he was asking about during your out of sequence deployment, your horseshoe malfunction uh, picture that's up on the screen right now. Is disconnecting the RSL a mandatory part of that emergency procedure? Thank you. Sorry, I got off here. Okay, so to clarify that piece of whether it's necessary to do the RSL piece um, of this emergency procedure and the uh, your own and your past. It does really help us to follow procedure um, in 
almost 100% of the scenarios where only a cutaway happened, the reserve pilot chute, when it came out, would always bounce off of the main risers first, have this kind of trajectory, and then inflate. It's still usually cleared. It still usually had a positive outcome, but it was a delayed positive outcome. And then in, in one of the scenarios uh, that result, it did result in that person would have died because there was um, simply the, the reserve wasn't able to, to safely open. Whereas on all of the scenarios where the procedure was followed that's outlined here, where you disconnect your RSL, cut away, clear the risers and then deploy the reserve, the outcome was 100% good. So again, we as a community don't necessarily get to see that, UPT does. That's why I really trust them. Um, I trust them with my life and my passenger's life. So do you have to? Well, you don't have to do anything. It's, it's your life ultimately and your passengers. But I hope that with the information um, communicated this way, um, you can recognize that your best interests are typically, uh, are, they're typically going to be by following these procedures. So uh, Gord, hopefully that answers the clarification uh, as well as the original question. Um, and if there isn't anything else, I, I don't have anything else right now with hands up. So Erica, you can continue on. Okay, I will stop sharing my screen. The only other thing I would say is that if anybody has any feedback on this graphic, I did just develop it because I was tired of like drawing a stick figure picture of this malfunction. So if anybody has any feedback, I'd love to hear it because um, I'm otherwise going to, you know, uh, allow anybody to use it for, for future training and, uh, and um, ongoing learning. Okay, but I uh, will stop sharing here so that we can carry on. Uh, so moving into our next section, uh, drogue fault. So I will say that these next pieces uh, are probably a little bit quicker than what we've done so far. Uh, but so into drogue fault. So everything that we're talking about now is going to be from the perspective that we've exited the airplane, we've thrown the drogue, and the drogue is out. Okay, so we're in drogue fault. So at this point, if we uh, throw the drogue, we look over our shoulder to check inflation, we find it is not inflated. Uh, then we would may wait about six to eight seconds uh, before we would go ahead and release the drogue. We don't want to get into tandem terminal. And if our drogue is not inflated, then it's not doing its job of slowing us down. So if we have an uninflated drogue, when we check it, we can wait up to six or eight seconds before we go ahead and uh, release the drogue. Okay. Uh, number 13, another skydiver entangled with you. So I'll start by saying that if you're having anybody jump with you, then please make sure to do a briefing with them uh, around where they should and should not be during the skydive, um, as well as everything, you know, having a minimum number of jumps, what to do during your deployment, when to break off, um, having those discussions with anybody that's going to be jumping with you. The other thing that would be important would be to talk to them about this emergency procedure. They don't need to know it. They just need to know that you know it, because that means that they won't act irrationally. They won't panic and do something. If they're entangled with your main, you don't want them to end up uh, deploying their main um, out of panic. So it's important to just let them know that if this happens, you have an emergency procedure for it. And the easiest way to remember this is to just strip the right side. Uh, so normally we use our left deployment, our primary deployment for the, the drogue as the left side, um, because the right side is supposed to be one for the student, but also we as skydivers are used to deploying on the right side. So de developing the muscle memory on the left side is a benefit to us. In this scenario, though, if it's easier to remember, then we're just going to strip the right side. So just I'll talk about that in whole and then I'll break it down. Uh, if we've given about uh, six to eight seconds for the person that's entangled with either our bridal or our drogue canopy to become unentangled, at this point, we're going to proceed to disconnect our RSL, cut away, then we will release the drogue, we'll then fall away and track for an amount of time that we're able to do altitude depending, but potentially five seconds if altitude permits, and then we will deploy our reserve. 
So what we're doing by affecting the emergency procedure this way is that instead of giving the full cutaway of an inflated parachute to the skydiver that's entangled, uh, we're now just giving them the, the bag. We're just going to give them the main canopy bag, which they can hopefully kind of envelop with them, get unentangled so that they'll be able to deploy themselves. So we're going to disconnect the RSL, cut away, then release the drogue. Then we'll move on to tracking away as able and deploying our reserve. Okay. Uh, so again, the easiest way to remember that is just strip the right side. Okay. So if you don't remember exactly the procedures for it or why that's okay. Just remember to strip the right side, track, deploy your reserve. All right. Uh, number 14, a student grabs one or both of your hands. Um, so if a student grabs your hands uh, during drogue fall, again, keeping in mind at this point, we do have a fully inflated drogue out. Uh, we need our hands in order to be able to uh, release the drogue. So if they have one of your hands, then you should still be trying to have them let go of it so that you have it in the event of an emergency procedure. Uh, otherwise, you can just go ahead if that hand isn't free at deployment time, you can choose to deploy the, um, your drogue with either of uh, the release handles, either the primary or the secondary. If the student happens to have both of your hands, then you're going to try a bit more aggressively at this point to have them release your hands. Proper training would be a great way to avoid this scenario. Just remembering to speak in positive, tell your students that you need your hands. If they get scared, then it's always safe for them to put their hands on their harness, on their main lift web, okay? But if we find ourselves in a scenario where a student has grabbed both of our hands, we're not able to end up releasing uh, any, either of the main, the main a primary or our secondary drogue releases, um, then we're going to, um, at this point, we're going to end up having uh, to use emergency, basically, you need to have a hand because otherwise you're now re relying quite heavily on um, a backup system, i.e. a Cypress AAD of some kind to, to deploy for you. So you need to get at least a hand free uh, if a student has it. In my experience, it's pretty rare for, for this to happen. So hopefully that's the case. I'd love to hear from you if you've uh, had a different experience. Um, so if we end up pulling one of the drogue releases, this is number 15 on our list. If we end up pulling one of the drogue releases and nothing happens, um, then we would go to our, our other drogue release. So in most scenarios these days, a lot of people are flying hand cams, which means that they're now using the secondary release. Uh, that means if your secondary release on the right hand side doesn't work, you're going to go to the left hand side and then you're going to try them both at the same time. If it means sacrificing your hand cam video, then you're going to do that um, in order to make sure that you try everything that you can to have the drogue actually release. In the event that that doesn't happen, then that ends up uh, resulting in what we call an inflated drogue and tow. An inflated drogue and tow is synonymous with basically a pilot shoot and tow. So we now have a, a drogue or a pilot shoot that's out, but a main container that's closed. So we would call this a total malfunction, uh, which would mean we wouldn't bother with the cutaway. We would just go straight to a reserve deployment. So if you have a pilot shoot or a drogue in tow, the container is closed. We're just going to go straight to a reserve deployment. Okay. Now in the scenario where we have a collapsed drogue in tow. So the in tow part basically means it's not actually doing its function of pulling out the main parachute, but the collapsed piece would indicate that the container has opened. That's the only way that the, that the drogue could possibly be uh, collapsed. These are incredibly rare, but having said that, we now have a partial malfunction because we've now opened our container so the container is open, which means that we could be more likely to have a main reserve entanglement. So in this scenario, we're going to follow a very similar process and procedure as we did for our out of sequence deployment. We're going to disconnect the RSL. We're going to cut away. We're going to clear our risers and then we will deploy the reserve. So again, a very unlikely emergency. 
it's still really good to know these uh, like the back of your hand if they if you happen upon them okay uh, number 18 is a detached drogue uh, so these are pretty unlikely with the the equipment the way that they are specifically the the sigma system um, but if you do have a detached drogue then your emergency procedure is to deploy the surf okay so you don't need to wait or try no don't i, I would specifically say don't try to open the main container because there won't be very much to pull the main out um, and now you have kind of a partial malfunction so go directly to the reserve if you have a detached drogue and then that Actually, your response should be quite the contrary. If you've had anything similar to a hard opening, then you want to make sure to test the limits of that parachute during its controllability check so that if you end up needing to turn really quickly for avoidance or otherwise, you know that that parachute is able to withstand everything that you need it to do. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the end of the drogue fall section. Um, I will say that uh, the last couple sections that we have are a lot easier because most of them uh, are similar for experienced jumpers. So if we have anybody that has any questions, um, I'm not too worried about uh, our, our timeline at this point because um, we're doing pretty well. So if you've got any questions, please let uh, either Nick or Allison know um, and we can address those before we move on to the next section. I am back here. So just a reminder, anyone that has a question, if you aren't typing it in the chat, um, there is a little icon and a reaction where it says raise hand and that alerts me to know you do have a question. And sorry, I'm gonna start my video here. Um, so I do know that Mayo, you have a question. I'm just gonna find you. Mayo, you had a question in the chat, but I'll let you direct that to Erica as well because it was a good question. I don't know if he sees that I've asked him to unmute. Um, hello. Hello. There you go. I'll let okay. you ask your question to Erica. Okay. Hello, everyone. And thank you, guys. Um, I was asking about um, in the situation when the third person is entangled with our drug. Um, uh, the speaker mentioned about clearing the right side, but she didn't mention about um, clearing the three ring release system at any moment. So I was asking if it uh, should be done in that situation as well. Um, so great cl clarification, Mayo, and thanks, thanks for pointing it out. So um, I think one of the areas where I actually could use some improvement is um, that it, almost any time that we enact a cutaway, we should actually be doing a verification of the clearing of our risers. So it, it actually should become synonymous. And I'm, I, I'll admit that I'm, I am definitely, uh, that's one of the areas where I need some work. So um, if you enact a cutaway, then ultimately, yes, you should always make sure that your risers are clear before you move on to anything else. Now with this particular emergency, um, one of the reasons that we normally need to clear our risers is if there hasn't been any sort of force acting on them to pull them away. Now, if you have a skydiver that's currently in one way, basically kind of connected to this, then it's probably going to result, um, ultimately going to result in those risers being cleared um, from you. And then also you're, before you deploy the reserve, you're also planning on, on tracking or getting away from uh, that person. So to simply answer your question, yes, you, you should also, at any time you're doing a cutaway, you should be making sure that there's a brief period where you're ensuring the release of those risers before you move on to reserve deployment. Um, in this scenario, I, I would say that I, I guess I haven't specified it because I think that probably the skydiver will have pulled them away for you. Um, but I guess I, I don't know for certain. So hopefully that's answered your question. 
Great. Uh, uh, Erica, I have a question next from, oh, I can't pronounce his name, but anyways, I, there you go. It's a very funny name in English. It's Facundo. It's a very typical name there you go. in Argentina. It's a very funny name in English. I was just going to so call you Mr. F. So we're good. Mr. F Mr. has a question F, for Mr. you. F. Sounds awesome. Mr. F. So it's, it's, it's me again. One question. There was an accident some years ago with a new tandem master in which he had an uninflated drawing toe and he failed to complete the procedures. I mean, he didn't release the drug, but after that, he deployed his reserve and the reserve got entangled with the pilot chute. So first he failed to, to open the container, right? He failed to release the drug, to pull that handle. I understand it. But uh, after that, the pilot, the drug, sorry, the drug got entangled with their reserve. And they said that it was because the reserve was not suited for that sigma. So I was wondering if in page uh, 104 of the sigma emergency procedures, we are having that exact situation, inflated drug in tow, poor reserve handle. So I was wondering, if how many test jumps have they done with an inflated or uninflated drawing toe opening their reserve and not getting entangled? I don't know if I made myself clear. Myself, okay. Uh, yes, very clear. Thanks, Facundo. It's a really great question. Um, so I'll, I'll answer this in a, a number of different pieces. One to say, I definitely don't know the actual numbers uh, that, that would represent uh, how and why they've, they've come to these figures. Um, so uh, I can always try to see if there's any answers around that. I, I doubt very highly that we'll get those specific answers from UPT or, or Tom Noonan. What I will say that I do know um, is that over the decades, they've definitely seen this go wrong. They've seen a lot of scenarios where they've had to adjust the length of um, the pilot, or not the pilot chute, but in our scenario of the drogue parachute, so that it didn't specifically hinder the slider of the reserve as it came down. And so unfortunately, we've had to learn from other people's mistakes, but a lot of R&D has surrounded making sure that the equipment that's used specifically in Sigma uh, prevents those kinds of occurrences. And so when they say that the reserve wasn't sort of approved for this system, that's one of the reasons why. It's because if you get a mismatch in the length of the drogue with the reserve that's coming out and where the slider would typically inflate and kind of come down to slow it, the opening of the reserve, then that's when you're more likely to have a, a double malfunction or you know a scenario where you have the drogue hindering the opening of the reserve parachute. Um, so I can't speak to numbers, uh, but I my expectation is that it's more it's still more frequent for us to see hang-ups when we enact a cutaway versus if we do not enact a cutaway. Uh, but you've also just touched on kind of the importance of why we can all agree and understand that when the manufacturer says you have to fly my gear, there's a financial aspect of that. Um, I don't even think Tom Noonan or Bill Booth would argue uh, with that logic that of course they've developed this equipment and they want it to be used in their container system. But the piece that you also can't argue is that the research and development that they're doing can only be guaranteed for the pieces that they sell. And so anytime you're going to add in um, a, a component that isn't theirs, then they, then they can no longer give you that information. They can't give you that security anymore that the emergency procedures that they're telling you to use um, are going to, to work in that scenario. So hopefully that gives you kind of part of the answer. Um, I'll reach out to, to Tom and see if I can get a better uh, response, uh, Facundo, if, if there does happen to be more information than I currently have um, in, my, in my current uh, wheelhouse. Excellent. And just a reminder, if we have answered your question, you can also lower your hand, would be great. Uh, I have a question from John Kieran. Hey, um, I just wanted to um, throw in a quick clarification with the question that Mayo had to Erica when he kind of referenced what she said as stripping the right side, which I think he might have 
heard as clearing the right side because he asked if we needed to clear the left. And I just wanted to clarify that you were talking about stripping the right side and that those were the handles we were using RSL cutaway and main as a way to just remember the sequence of the handles we were stripping or pulling as opposed to then clearing the risers that you do after every time you cut away. So that's, I just wanted to throw that out there because I thought I understood what he was asking. Yeah, and, and thanks a lot. I, I appreciate that because obviously I probably didn't catch that I used the wrong word for that. And uh, and sorry, May, if that meant that uh, I didn't answer your, your question um, fully and accurately. So um, that's great. Is there anybody else with any questions? I do not see anyone. So I know that uh, we've had some questions on the side, but they look like they're being answered. So unless uh, Nick has anything to add for questions from what he's seeing on chat, I think you're good for the uh, next section. All right, fantastic. So we're moving into what I would say uh, the majority of these next sections are kind of just a bit of housekeeping. For the most part, what I really like about teaching the canopy portion of this is that instead of teaching uh, tandem instructors that have only been doing this since they had, you know, at least 500 skydives, the majority of the canopy relating canopy related malfunctions are ones that you've got experience with during your emergency procedures review since you were a, a baby skydiver. Um, so some of these I'm going to go over fairly quickly, and that's because I, I do want to be able to at least wrap up um, the bones of our presentation in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes here, uh, and then allow for additional discussion, more questions and that sort of thing, but with people able to, to leave if they need to. Okay, uh, so under the canopy, uh, a bag lock. So a bag lock is a high speed malfunction. Again, we've been talking about this one since we had zero skydives in your first jump class, you would have learned about this. Um, you can try to clear it. Uh, you know, the manual will tell you that you can uh, sort of grab the risers and try to shake to, to deploy that, um, to get the main parachute to come out of the bag. Um, but having said that, you're under a, you know, a malfunction that's not going to be able to be cleared. You're going to cut away and deploy your reserve. Uh, number 21, uh, a streaming main uh, that isn't inflating. Similarly, we know about this one as experienced jumpers. Uh, if we're not able to clear it, if there's nothing that we can do, then we're going to cut away and deploy our reserve. Uh, line twists. So my only pet peeve and the thing that I like to make sure to impose on the skydiving community as a whole is that I feel that we tend to be a bit cavalier around line twists. We tend to treat them as being a, an inconvenience rather than a malfunction. And that can be the case very often. I, I would say we get complacent with just being really good at getting out of line twists and knowing that we can. Having said that, if you're still in line twists at 3000 feet, that is still a malfunction. That is still a parachute that you cannot land. So it's the only piece that I like to remind you. If you're in line twists, uh, then I also recommend that you do an audio uh, command of what altitude you're at at a given time. So that if you're under 4,000 feet and you're in line twists, you're actually verbalizing that. Your passenger doesn't care. We all know if you've done a few tandems, you figured out very quickly that tandem passengers generally don't remember a whole lot of their skydive and they certainly don't care what you're saying. Um, and so if you, if you just yell out your altitude, I am at 4,000 feet, kick, 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 do whatever you need to do, distort yourself, get your passenger to help. I'm at 3,500 feet and just verbalize it. Um, it will really help to make sure that you continue to do it, but also that you don't do that kind of age old thing where you like check the time, but don't actually see what time it is, i.e. checking the altitude, but not really actually knowing what altitude you are at at that moment. 3,000 feet is our hard deck. It's our decision altitude. Keeping in mind that if you're flying over any terrain that might not be 3,000 feet above ground level, you need to keep that in mind as well. So if you're right next to a mountain range and your altimeter says that you're at 4,000 feet, um, you need to keep in mind that you might already be at 3,000 feet AGL. Okay. Uh, and then moving on to uh, the drogue, or sorry, the um, tension knots. Uh, so again, tension knots are something that you might be able to spend a bit of time uh, correcting a turn. If it's, you know, a tension knot on the left-hand side and you're turning to the left, you could unstow the right-hand side and the left-hand side, but be correcting in order to give yourself a little bit of time. Uh, this malfunction is at least a slower speed malfunction. Uh, you can try to, to pump toggles and clear that tension knot. 
If you're not able to, then you're going to cut away and deploy the reserve by your decision altitude. By now, I hope that I've drilled into your head as being 3,000 feet. Uh, a line over, uh, very similarly, you can try the manual outline that you take both toggles and do two very uh, aggressive flares of the parachute to try to clear a line over. Uh, if you're not able to clear the line over, then you're going to cut away and deploy the reserve. Um, number 25, uh, drogue entangled with the main canopy. So this one's also still the same. If you're a sport jumper that has a pilot chute that's tangled with your main canopy, you're going to do a canopy control check. So again, anytime you have any questions around whether that parachute might or might not work well for you, do a vigorous check of it. So making sure that you're doing really aggressive left and right turns uh, and different stages of flare as well to make sure that it can work for you under all circumstances. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if you deem that you can't land it safely, then cut away and deploy your reserve. If you deem that you can land it safely, make that decision by 3,000 feet. Um, and you can still land it if it has all of the maneuverability of a good parachute for landing. Uh, so number 26, two canopies out. Um, so this one, I feel like we don't do a lot of training uh, for this one for both tandems as well as, as sport jumpers, um, but it's actually pretty simple when it gets broken down. So there's kind of three configurations that you can have two canopies out in. Uh, you can either have them kind of front and back, so that would be considered uh, what we call a biplane. You can have them side by side, um, or they can end up being in a, a downplane configuration. Uh, very simply put, if you don't remember all of the details, if you have parachutes over top of your head, then you're going to keep them. Uh, you're going to fly them very gently without unstowing the toggles and prepare for a PLF. So that's if the parachutes are above you. Um, if the parachutes end up beside you, so that they're in a down, down plane, then you're going to disconnect the RSL. That's just to minimize the additional possible snag. And then you're going to uh, cut away that one parachute so that you end up pendulum underneath uh, the reserve parachute. So to just be a bit more specific, so if you end up in a, a biplane orientation, typically you're gonna end up flying the front parachute. You're gonna do this with either the front or the rear risers. Uh, you're just gonna make gentle turns and you're going to plan for a PLF landing. Uh, if you're under a side-by-side, -side, similarly, what they would normally say with experienced jumpers is to fly the more like aggressive or dominant parachute. Uh, in a tandem type situation, both of your parachutes are very docile. Um, so most likely you'll end up flying the main parachute with uh, either your front or your rear risers. And the important piece, if they're in a side-by-side, -side, is to make small, gentle turns so that one of the parachutes can't get away from the other and generate into a down plane. So you wanna give time if you're making a turn for the other parachute to kind of catch up and stay in that side by side configuration. Okay, and then in both of those scenarios where you're landing uh, as a PLF without flaring, I just wanna keep, uh, just to sort of note that your descent rate is going to be significantly different. You're under a lot of fabric, so you're going to be uh, at the mercy of the wind a lot more than you might be used to. So you want to just make sure to spend extra time focused on where you are in relation to your landing area and making sure that you've got outs if the wind is um, going to end up potentially pulling you backwards. Um, so just, just keeping that in mind. Okay. Um, and then I've had a really great question. And I, I love when I get questions that I haven't really heard before, or that make me think. Um, and, uh, and it's actually one of the, the sort of uh, topics that I bring up anyways, is that if you have a reserve parachute, would you expect a lot of rocking back and forth, um, as they often do open in kind of a, a rock and roll type configuration because of the deep break settings? 
um, in the scenario where you have two parachutes out. And I mean, I'm, I'm honestly going to answer that I, I don't know because I don't want to give the wrong answer. So if you know anything about me, I will absolutely not give the wrong answer. I'd rather give no answer than the wrong answer and come back to you. Um, my expectation is, um, my expectation is no, but I, I'm going to say that I'm going to come back to you on that one. And if anybody else has, has an answer or thinks that they want to chime in, then I think that would be a great one to otherwise discuss, uh, at some length, uh, here at the, the end of the section or at the, the end of the conversation, because that's a, that's a really great question. Thanks for bringing it up. Um, so sort of moving on from, from the two canopies. So I'll just, I'll just summarize that one. So if we have two canopies out, um, you're not meant to unstow, uh, any of the, the brakes, uh, if you've got either a biplane, so from front and back or a two out situation, and you're meant to just do a PLF, if they end up in a down plane configuration, uh, then we're going to disconnect the RSL and cut away. Um, and then we move on to the more specific, these ones end up being a bit more tandem oriented. If we end up with, uh, with failures of our, our toggles, so our, either our primary or our secondary toggles. And I'm going to bring up an, an image for this one too, just to show for those of you that are able to see uh, my screen, I'm just going to share the image that's on uh, the manual. Oh, that's not the right one. Sorry, guys. It's the wrong one here. Sorry about that. There we go. All right. Why is it? There we go. Um, is that right, Nick? Can you see the correct screen? Okay. Sorry about the delay there, guys. Okay, so this is just uh, on page 12, I believe, of the Sigma 2 main canopy. Uh, the, in the tandem manual. So this is just showing the configuration of those brakes. And so the reason why I find that it's important to, to show this or to explain it is because the emergency procedure that's outlined by UPT is expecting that you're flying a parachute that's in this configuration. So when they say, if you have a primary control line, that's one of your gold toggles that breaks, um, then go ahead and you're gonna cut away and deploy your reserve. So that's the emergency procedure outlined by UPT. And that's because if you look at this configuration, um, and so for anybody that happens to not be able to see it, uh, we've got four cascaded lines that are going uh, ultimately to that gold toggle. Whereas the secondary, the black or the flare toggles only has two um, lines in this configuration. And so that's where the emergency procedure stems from, is from it being in this orientation, which is how it comes from the manufacturer. So if you have a primary control handle that is faulty, it's broken, then you're going to cut away and deploy the reserve. Whereas if you have a broken black toggle, then you can do a control check and then decide for yourself if you can safely land that parachute. And that's because of the fraction of the parachute that's held by each of those toggles. The reason I like to bring up the diagram and discuss this in a little bit more variation is because there are lots of drop zones globally that don't use the Sigma canopy. You're supposed to, you know, in the um, Sigma container. However, we know that globally there are lots of um, drop zones that use Icarus and Hops and other parachutes, and those could have different configurations. So knowing that configuration might change your emergency procedure for this. I know that I have jumped at drop zones in the past where the yellow uh, gold uh, instructor toggle didn't have a very high fraction of the parachute. So if it broke, my procedure would probably have been to do a control check and decide from there uh, versus what the actual manufacturer recommendation is based on their toggle configurations. So hopefully that makes some sense. I'll stop the share here um, and, uh, and move on to our next section. So just, just to summarize that, broken gold toggle, cutaway deploy reserve, broken black toggle, uh, do a canopy control check, determine if you think it's landable. If not, by 3,000 feet, cutaway deploy the reserve. Um, so then number 29 is uh, the rock and roll opening. So uh, that kind of got brought up as a, you know, a question around what to do if the reserve uh, 
like opens in a rock and roll configuration. So I do always like to remind people if they haven't had a reserve opening, it does open in deep breaks. It can tend to pendulum back and forth. Um, then uh, it, it can be important uh, for us to know that so that we don't panic or think that we're in a, a double malfunction just to go ahead and release the brakes so that it isn't doing the, the rocking back and forth. Um, and then I think that that's a, a fairly good segue into um, the last piece that I have, a couple pieces that I have to talk about in this section. So I will say that in the current version of the manual, which is, is meant to be revised uh, very soon, uh, it doesn't include a do not cut away below altitude. And I think this is a really important thing to discuss in both your personal life as well as in your professional life. So as an experienced jumper, you should have a value that is your personal do not cut away below altitude and then one for your tandems as well. At the moment, it's not outlined uh, in the UPT manual and I expect it will stay that way. I think that for you personally, it would be important for you to have that number in mind so that you're not making the decision on the spot. So scenarios where you could end up needing to execute an emergency procedure below your hard deck would be, say, in a canopy entanglement situation or a wing suitor flies through and breaks some of your lines, um, something unexpected. So if you end up, say, at 1,500 feet, it would be important for you to already know in your mind whether you're still cutting away and deploying your reserve or if you're simply going to add fabric. Uh, so for students, I normally tell them that a thousand feet is generally going to be their bottom line for that, where they would no longer cut away. They would simply deploy their reserve to add fabric. Uh, I personally use a value of 1,800 feet, uh, but I would recommend that you have a conversation with uh, people around your own drop zone, uh, people that you feel comfortable talking to, um, and just uh, assess your own sort of trust in the sky hook system and your own equipment and uh, at what altitude you'd rather add fabric. And then that brings me into my last point, uh, which is relating to the Collins lanyard. So the malfunction that happened most recently uh, that resulted in that advisory relating to the hand cam release. The Collins lanyard, uh, it, I just want to remember, I just want to make sure to remind everybody that while we talk about the RSL being a secondary method of being able to deploy the reserve, we need to remember that while that is true, it also acts as a cutaway for your left riser. Okay, so the RSL is connected to our condom standard, and if we need to use that, it can be used absolutely to deploy a reserve. But in the event where you already have a main parachute, it is going to disconnect your left riser. So if you cannot use your left hand and you need your reserve parachute, then you need to find a way to use your right hand to reach across and get your reserve out. Because using that sort of secondary tactic for releasing your reserve, for deploying your reserve, is also going to have the negative effect of disconnecting your left main riser, which is fine in a scenario where we just need to get our reserve out, but not great in a scenario where we don't want to be getting rid of any part of our main. Okay, uh, Allison's going to take your questions now. Well, right now I see no hands up, but if anyone has any questions, I know there's been some coming through there, which you've been answering as well. And it, yeah. Yeah. all right. Well, I see no hands up, Erica. You're just doing a smashing job. I love it. I'll let you continue on unless uh, er er Nick sees anything otherwise. Um, so Nick is just advising me that there's a pretty good discussion going on in the chat right now regarding like if you had a broken yellow toggle at around 2000 feet. And again, all of those scenarios are just a little bit too specific, right? Um, so that's where it's going to involve a little bit of your own judgment relating to that. Do not cut away below altitude, um, but also the importance of doing a really thorough canopy check above our hard deck so that hopefully um, things like that aren't happening in a pinch. 
But again, that's not outlined, right? We don't, we, because UPT isn't going to say at these exact altitudes exactly what to do. Um, so you do get to use some of your own judgment when it comes to that uh, until there's more data that's potentially generated um, so that this information ends up in a manual for us. Um, but so moving on, I just have a couple of discussion topics uh, here. Uh, Erica, yeah. sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. There's just a question that came from Keith on the chat right now. Uh, so on a two out, a non down plane scenario, what is the suggested setting for your passengers harness and or connect connections? Um, so uh, just to, to sort of reiterate, I'm guessing um, the, the question is relating to whether to still have the passenger connected. Uh, and there isn't really any scenario except for one I'm going to talk about here shortly, the, the water landing, where you would disconnect the lower passenger from yourself. It's always recommended at this point based on manufacturer procedure to uh, have the passenger still connected to you at, at the hips. Um, and so I would say that's still important so that you're not able to discount, like basically get into a configuration where you're um, dissociating from your passenger on, on landing. Uh, I hope that answers the question. So I think it, it was specifically relating to, to whether to still have the laterals connected um, during a, a sort of a side-by-side -side, uh, two out scenario with the parachute. I just asked him if it if it helps and if it clarified it. So if not, I will let you know. Oh, yep, yeah, it's all good. Thanks so much. Perfect. Um, okay, so uh, for landings, uh, the only two topics I want to cover, uh, number 31, uh, strong ground winds. So just remembering, the main thing here is just to remember to disconnect our RSL. Um, we are meant to have the passenger reconnected to ourselves after uh, we've adjusted them for landing under, under the main parachute. Um, and so that does make us disconnecting from them upon landing a little bit uh, longer. It takes a little, it's a little bit trickier. So it's more important for us to make sure we have that RSL disconnected in the event of strong wind so that we can cut away our main parachute um, so that it can prevent us from, from being drug away. Um, I would add in this scenario to make sure that if you know that you're in a scenario with high winds, I wouldn't advise disconnecting the RSL until you get below your do not cut away below um, altitude. Uh, so for me, that would be about 1800 feet for you at your discretion, but I just, I wouldn't recommend uh, disconnecting your RSL at say two or 3000 feet at a, a height where it might be still useful for you to have that uh, that RSL, the sky hook, engaging your reserve parachute for you. Okay. Uh, and then if a water landing is imminent. So this is my last one that I'm going to talk about. And then I'm, I'm going to kind of close down uh, at least my piece of all the talking and let hopefully many of you do a lot of the question answering. Uh, so if a water landing is imminent, then hopefully that means that you have flotation device because you aren't meant to be jumping near water unless you have flotation device. So the procedure is as follows. And I, this is one I'd recommend that you just double check in the manual. Uh, it's, it's fairly lengthy, but probably uncommon. So if you happen to be in a scenario where, where water, water landings are possible, please verify it again. Um, most of us aren't dropping in those scenarios. So I'm just gonna go over it once uh, slowly, uh, but just the one time. So we're going to, uh, once we know that we're definitively going to be landing in the water, uh, we're going to go ahead and have the student inflate their flotation device. We need to disconnect our RSL. So again, I would recommend that this action be done a little bit lower in case we still need that RSL. We're going to disconnect our chest strap as the instructors. And then we're, we're also going to make sure that the lower connection points are now disconnected from ourselves and reconnected to the passenger uh, plastic um, keepers. We're going to land preferably still into the wind if you're landing in a location where uh, there is uh, potentially a boat or something nearby then, then land somewhere as close as possible to safety. Do not ever engage a cutaway procedure over water as it's uh, very likely that your depth perception is thrown off by the water itself. Uh, once you have landed, you should still be flaring into the wind with a full landing. 
Uh, if you need to, you can cut away the parachute if it's dragging you, say, downstream or the wind uh, is dragging you away. You're then going to disconnect your passenger, push them away, uh, swim away from the parachute, and uh, inflate your own flotation device. So again, that's quite a mouthful. And the only reason I'm not going to bother going over it again is that I think it doesn't likely apply to a ton of you. And those of you that it does apply to, uh, please find it in the Tandem Sigma Emergency Procedures section of the manual, which is on page 98. All right, um, so I'm going to end with uh, just a, a quick video from one of my relatively obvious mentors in this sport. Uh, and that is uh, Mr. Tom Noonan. Uh, it's just a 30 second video, so don't worry. I'm not going to be boring you guys for very long. Um, why does it keep doing this to me? There we go. All right, here we go. Here's Tom. 5,000 or one in a million, right? They want the one in a million. They deserve those odds. They deserve the best odds we can give them. So as we rush through our seasons, as we rush through our days, as we rush through jump we try to make just remember that everything we do that has a successful positive outcome is not by chance success um you are Okay, so um, I think Tom just really, really nicely summarizes that uh, basically us being prepared and us making good decisions ultimately ends up in good outcomes. I really like that. I couldn't say it any better. The piece that I want to close with, we all end up basing the way that we train our passengers and the way that we fly our tandems on uh, our lived experience. We have engaged and seen certain behaviors more often. If we've experienced certain things that our friends haven't, then we're going to have certain perceptions of how things should be done. And what I'll say that I rely heavily on is my knowledge and my trust that uh, the things that are published in UPT's manual aren't based on just one or two people's based on a very big data set, much bigger than my own perception. Uh, and so just keeping that in mind, I find gives me a lot more trust in why I'm supposed to do things a certain way, even if um, my ex experiences have shown me otherwise, uh, I'm still able to follow manufacturers recommendations uh, because of that knowledge. So thank you all for uh, your attendance here so far tonight. Uh, I'm sorry, I feel like I've gone over a little bit uh, with this presentation that I'd wanted to. Um, I'm going to open it up to discussion. I have gotten a couple of questions sent to me directly, uh, but my plan will be at this point to kind of just uh, leave it as some open discussion. And I'm going to throw those questions out for other people to answer because I think I'm tired of hearing myself talk. You guys are probably uh, looking forward to hearing some other voices as well. So thank you all questions, open discussion. I'm still gonna be here. I'm gonna have one of those mini human things that's probably gonna cost me pretty soon. Uh, so I might be in and out, but I'll still make myself available for uh, pretty much the majority of the next hour for any uh, extra questions or discussion that you guys might wanna have. And uh, thank you, Erica. I do, I see some hands up. So I will get to those questions really quickly here or in a moment. Uh, Erica, cannot thank you enough. In case some of you guys are jumping to leave, um, Gord, my husband and I uh, can't thank all of you enough. We have people from all over the world here today, Spain, Mexico, the United States, Canada, uh, the UK, uh, by all means, if wherever else you're from in the world, please let us know on the sides. I appreciate some of you are doing this at three o'clock in the morning. Um, so before I get to some of the questions, I just wanted to let you know, as I said at the beginning, um, Skydive Vancouver Island is located in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Uh, we are hosting a 2021 virtual safety seminar series. Uh, we've, this is kind of the second in our series. Uh, next Tuesday, 
On April 20th, we do have a safety seminar for advanced canopy pilots. Uh, it's going to be, uh, we're hosting it. It's going to be the presented by Nicholas Helfrich, who is a coach three here in Canada. Um, so lots of information there. They will be a little bit shorter. They're planned for an hour and a half, but it is at the same time. Um, and I will certainly send this information out. On Tuesday, April the 27th, uh, very excited to host a wingsuit uh, safety seminar. Uh, and Scott Callantine is an ISC wingsuit flying on the committee, flying committee. He will be presenting for that. On Thursday, the 29th, we have a safety seminar for those of you who are riggers. Uh, and it's our technical and safety committee chair with the Canadian Sport and Parachuting Association, Bill Petney will be hosting that. So I'll make sure that I get that information out to everyone as well. They all start at 6 p.m. Um, and again, I hope many of you when this COVID stuff is all done, we can travel and we welcome all of you guys up to uh, beautiful Vancouver Island and come jump with us. In the meantime, I have Danielle, uh, Daniel. or Daniel, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna unmute you because your hand is up with a question. Hi, th thank you so much for uh, putting this together. It's been very informative, and very thorough as well. Um, yeah, I would also like to thank Allison for putting this together. Um, and then Allison, I'm gonna leave it to you to decide whether you want to do this or not, because I know there's a, a lot of humans on this feed, but I'd love to get some other people answering the questions where possible. So I don't know if there's an easy way to do that. Um, but I, I mean, even if a couple of you wanna sort of put your hands up to say, I'm, I'm willing to answer some questions, I'd love for it to be a bit more discussion. I just don't know if we can do that with a, a hundred bodies. In yeah, a, no worries. So I have have allowed uh, you each and all of you to unmute yourselves. Obviously, we're going to have a lot of feed going back and forth. Um, so we're just going to have to, you know, we've been doing this now for how long? I mean, if there is some cool things that have come out of COVID, I guess, um, and that's being able to bring people all around the world and learning patience and manners and interrupting each other. But uh, yeah, so you guys all have the ability to unmute yourselves right now. Um, you should. Yes. Yay, yay, I hear somebody. So um so yeah, Erica, there you go. Everyone can chat or ask so questions I, freely. I just, I just had a, a, a quick question uh regarding maybe not an emergency procedure, but regarding uh, if there's a standard or a best uh, practice to uh to land safely uh with a, an unconscious passenger, whether to, to protect them and ourselves. I just wonder if there's a there's a, a best way to to approach this landing. Um, that's a great question. I'd love for some other people to to chime in because I I would say that the best practice varies super widely based on uh, where the actual landing area is going to be, um, whether you're able to land in sort of a pea gravel bowl or otherwise, uh, but also sort of the strength and the abilities of the tandem instructor, uh, because uh, a, a larger or a taller instructor is going to have a better ability to uh, potentially scoop the passenger's legs. Uh, with their own legs. Uh, I know in sort of the, the couple of scenario, I, I've actually only had one, I've had one scenario where I've had to do it myself. Um, I did kind of try to scoop the legs and when that didn't really work very well, uh, I ended up doing a bit of a, a sort of an uneven flare blind man type tactic. Uh, but I admit that I feel like it was 57% uh, luck and 43% skill. Um, so if anybody else has any uh, suggestions around um, how they would tackle this. I mean, personally, I would probably say, uh, Daniel, for you to ask somebody that's a similar size to you, uh, what they would do. Um, because I would probably not benefit from how you would do it um, based on the fact that I'm, you know, five foot four. Uh, so that would be my feedback, but let's see if anybody else wants to unmute and, and give any kind of answer. I believe it, it would be good to kick the passenger's uh, legs up while, while you're landing, obviously, right? And the other thing that I find very useful is that if you notice that the passenger is uh, like swallowing their own tongue, you should try to take it out because maybe they are ep epileptic or something like they didn't tell you. So trying to get their tongue out uh, would be useful. I would... <clears throat> 
I would say avoid it all together. Do your harness well. I think uh, I've never had anybody pass out. I know it can happen, but if you do a good harness and you don't jack it all down and make it so that people can't breathe, you probably got a better chance of not having somebody pass out. That being said, I guess if they were going to, I would try to get their legs up and move the leg straps under their thighs the best I could before I landed to try and really get them in that sitting position. So like Erica said, you got your best chance of trying to get your feet under theirs when you land. Um, but that's kind of sounds like a not fun scenario. Uh, yeah, excellent answer. Thanks for jumping in on that one, John. Uh, so that, that kind of segues fairly well to, um, I did have somebody private message me to ask um, recommendations on dealing with heavier passengers. Um, so if anybody wants to jump in and just make some suggestions around how they deal with heavier passengers, that would, that, I think that would be great. Um, I'm from New York. I like to talk. I'll do some more. Um, if they're dudes and they're solid, you just got to maybe like follow the UPT harnessing guide, really make sure that the harness is on pretty solid, but not over tight because I think a major problem with a lot of instructors these days is over tightening the harness, especially in the plane. Um, so dudes tend to be a little more solid, so it's a little easier to get on. Heavier female passengers, if I could be like, I don't know, gender weird, they tend to be a little softer. So sometimes you really gotta make sure that even though if they're big, you gotta make sure that you have the harness set for their actual height and not the amount of space they take up with the harness if someone's kind of round and soft. It comes with experience, but you know, spend a little more time on the harness, get really good at harnessing and it makes the bigger, heavier people a lot easier to deal with. I think harnessing is something that is really, really lacking in a lot of tandem instructors. Great, thanks. Uh, thank you for, for that too. So I'm gonna take a moment. Uh, this is my little, my little gremlin, uh, possibly my future skydiver, we will see, but um, I just want to chime in on the, the heavier passenger piece. So yeah, one of the things that I would outline is that we as a society tend not to want to say no to people, but the harness isn't necessarily made for all body types. And that is going to be specific to, um, <laughs> it's going to be specific to um, sort of larger bodied, uh, bottomed women. Some of those people probably shouldn't be going on skydives. If they are, uh, it could be recommended to have them placed in a hanging harness in advance to make sure that it fits properly. Uh, and you might also find uh, for lack of a politically correct term that because of the fat slump, it can help for you to do an additional tightening uh, before you get in the airplane. So normally we can do just one adjustment of the harness. Uh, I have found that with women that are of higher BMI, it's uh, sometimes necessary to uh, do an extra tightening as it does kind of wiggle into their folds. And I'm sorry, I don't know of a politically correct way to say that. Um, I'm going to pause for a bit and go with her, but Nick is still on. Uh, he can help with anything that you have. And I'll, I'll come back as soon as I uh, make sure that this one's uh, in bed. Does anyone have any other direct questions or do you guys just, oh, hi, Nick. I, I should take this moment to also thank Nick. And just so you guys are aware, uh, Nick is uh, Erica's significant other. He is also very well versed and experienced as a tandem instructor and, and many other things. Um, uh, in, I actually put him into our system today and I think the only thing you don't have, Nick, is a uh, rigor B for CSPA. So anyways, <laughs> uh, so that lots of questions. Anyone have anything they just want to talk about? I, I, I know in Canada, we're dealing like everywhere with COVID. Darn New Zealand and Australia, you guys are doing awesome. Um, I know our opening season, season is just around the corner. Um, it was delayed. Is that everyone have, that's it? If, if the conversation is still going when Erica gets back, then she will address the side lateral question that came up. 
Um, I think somebody mentioned that in the chat a little while ago when I ran away to pick up the little one, but um, she will address that uh, once she's back, if uh, there are still people on here and, and they want to hear it. Uh, Nick, I have a question from John, but also Ariel, thank you very much. We do love our jerseys. They're pretty styling. I don't know if you can tell, nice oh, BC flag down the arm. Uh, you can private message me and I would happily, we'd ship them anywhere. So yes. Uh, John, go ahead uh, with your question. Look, we can see John's face now from New York. Hey. Um, how does everybody deal with COVID and doing tandems? I kept all my tandem passengers covered all last year through free fall. We used like the Sigma buffs or if they had a face mask and the buff. Um, but I didn't get sick last year. Like it was the first year of doing tandems ever. I also bought a full face as uh, I acquiesced to my wife and I hate a full face, but, um, I kept my students covered, not like video, no video. Everybody was covered. I didn't get sick. Um, now this year it's like, uh, I'm half vaccinated. Some people are vaccinated. It's kind of starting to be like, well, oh, maybe we'll uncover their face. I'm just wondering what other people are doing. Um, great question, John. As you know, I am not a tandem instructor. I'm a, I'm a drop zone owner with my husband. Uh, but one of the things we also did covers, uh, we had buffs, Sigma. That was awesome that they gave such cheap discounts on the buffs. We've ordered more for this year. Um, one of the other things too, we, we had our TIs, they changed their shirts. We provided staff shirts. They changed their shirts for every tandem. Um, just to, from the spit and stuff that's flying, you guys know what it's like. So that was one of the things. And our tandem instructors smelt so lovely, like bounce sheets, fresh and new every jump. Um, so I know just in addition, that was one of the things we did as well. So uh, they, uh, uh, John, uh, so what the other thing we did too was, uh, we did the same thing. We required, we had everybody at full face helmets. I didn't get sick last year either, which was really nice. Um, but we, we had people buff up in the plane, but once they're out of, like once the door was open and my mask was down, we let them pull them down if they wanted to. Um, and, but I, I still had mine up underneath, underneath my mask. And then, so then when the canopy opened, I could open up my mask and whatever, I don't know. At least their video turned out a little bit better. And that's that's why I sort of ended up doing that more than anything else. But yeah, same kind of challenges. I wondered, like, I didn't get sick, but I didn't know if free fall did it. Like this year, we're keeping everybody covered in the plane and it's starting to be a little more like, all right, if you want to take it off in free fall, you can. You know, it's all kind of anecdotal, but I was wondering, like, you know, how other people were dealing. Yeah, I'm basically telling people, once the door opens, if or once we're at the door, if you want to pull it down, you can go ahead and pull it down. That's what I'm saying. So. From a from a medical perspective, um, it would be my wish that everybody just always have a mask on all the time, even if the the minimalist in you says a buff is okay. Just having something covering your face to prevent fluid coming from their body into yours or vice versa is probably going to make a huge difference. Um, that said, I'm a, I'm a medical person and I'm, I'm kind of not doing tandems right now just because the risk for me is not worth it. Uh, hopefully it becomes a far less issue um, by, the, by the busy season in, here in North America, at least with vaccine rollout. I realize that that's not a great answer for everybody because the vaccine rollout is not the same everywhere that's on this chat. Uh, but hopefully for you, you're all doing something to keep masks on or whatever it is to stay safe out there. Yeah, that's a good point, Nick. Uh, being in the military, uh, John brings up a good point. Like it's the human tendency, right? As things kind of drag on, people become a little bit more complacent and uh, the risk just wasn't there. I, I couldn't town them at all, that just at the risk of bringing it back into the military, so. Yeah, so each person has to, uh, has to sort of make their own, um, their own decisions on that front, I suppose. 
Uh, but as Gord mentioned, uh, full face helmets are a really good idea, making sure that you're masked up as an instructor, trying to make sure that your students are masked up as best you can. Um, and yeah, and hope for the best if it's something that you need to be doing because that's your full time gig. Um, I have a, a side question here as well. Um, just Nick, you'll probably be able to answer this if Erica can't. Um, so what is the procedure to hook up a passenger in a tight 182? Yeah, I can definitely, I can definitely feel that one. Um, there, there are a few different ways that people tend to, to use the 182 to sit in and, and to exit. And um, personally, I'm a big fan of being seated in a 182 or in a small Cessna aircraft like that, um, facing the back of the airplane. And I, I like that both sitting in the front or in the JM position right next to the pilot, if you will. And I, I like that sitting in the back of the airplane. So typically, as long as weight and balance will allow from a pilot's perspective, uh, having the, your, the instructor's rig against the back of the pilot seat. So in either of those two situations, most specifically in a narrow body 182, um, the, the key is to make sure that the person you're in the airplane with is cognizant of the fact that there are two tandems in the airplane. Um, and if, if, there are not, if there's not another tandem in the back of the plane and you're sitting up front uh, for whatever reason, um, making sure that those people are, are giving you the space that you need. Um, in, in the 182, I tend to connect. If I'm sitting next to the pilot, I'll start there. If I'm sitting next to the pilot, I tend to connect my lowers uh, as soon as we're in the airplane. Now I realize that this is maybe not the best practice, especially in an emergency situation, but I have, am cognizant of the fact that that's what I'm doing and that I need to disconnect those lower connection points if we're going to be in an aircraft emergency. I find with, with the lowers connected, um, it's fairly easy to do up the tops because the, the customer is sitting between my legs and I'll just wrap, sort of wrap my legs around them. Um, it's a little bit awkward, but doing a tandem skydive in general is a little bit awkward. So you, you sort of, as an instructor, need to get over that, that little piece. Um, to, to get those lowers tightened. Bye. Sorry, that's the little one saying goodbye for anybody that cares. To get the... To get the lowers tightened adequately, sitting next to the pilot, I typically in a narrow body 182 do need to have the customer sit up on my legs. If there's no way that the customer can move, I'll figure it out. But ideally they sit up on my legs and that's the, the language that I will use. I will never ask a customer to sit on my lap. I will say, please push yourself up onto my legs. They'll sit on my legs. I can tighten those connectors up okay, appropriately, and then I can sort of slide my legs to the side and let them sit back down on the floor of the aircraft. And then I can easily connect my upper connection points. Uh, when I'm sitting in the... When I'm sitting in the back of the airplane, um, it's a lot easier, but because my procedure sitting in the front of the airplane is to have a customer sit on my legs. I will always also have the customer sit on my legs when I'm in the back of the airplane because I don't ever want to treat one customer different from another, um, sort of from a liability perspective. And so sitting in the back of the airplane, I'll do the same thing, only obviously there's a lot more, a lot more space there. Again, I'm seated with my back facing the front of the aircraft in either of those two positions. When the door comes open, it's very easy for me to turn and get my left leg out of the airplane, allowing the customer to swing their legs out of the airplane and then get my right leg out or bring my right foot back and be on my right knee in the door of the aircraft. I realize this is a little bit difficult as a, just me describing it, it's a lot easier to demonstrate. I wish I could sit at a mock-up and show you guys how that works. It's just not a, a reality at this point in time. 
But the key for me is making sure that the customer is sitting on my legs, I can get those laterals tightened, and then I squish them down back between my legs, back with their bums on the floor. Either way, I can then easily do up the uppers. Uh, hopefully that answers the, the question. Um, I know, as I said, some people like to uh, exit a 182 facing the front of the airplane from their knees. I've seen it done. I learned this on my course when I first started doing tandems almost 15 years ago, I think it was now. And for me, it was just super uncomfortable. But if you're going to do that, usually uh, there are two ways to have the customer, either sitting on their bum facing the front of the aircraft. If Again, if you're sitting next to the pilot, they're facing the front of the aircraft, either with their feet out in front of them, down towards the rudder pedals, not my preferred choice, or with the customer also on their knees with their feet underneath them. I would then sort of straddle their feet and bring my knees up as close as I could to them. And we're kind of in this awkward forward leaned kneeling position so that I can easily reach down and connect those laterals. Um, if I'm exiting from my knees, I'm not connecting the laterals as soon as we're in the airplane uh, it, because it's just not possible to do any sort of moving or turning around in the airplane uh, with them done up. So the customer would get on their knees, I would get on my knees behind them, connect the lowers, connect the uppers uh, once the lowers are tight and it should be fairly simple in that, in that scenario. In the back of the airplane, to me, this is a really difficult way of doing it in the back of the airplane, but you can do the exact same thing behind the pilot seat. One thing that I would say is in a small 182, um, try to make sure that the customer is not holding on to the back of the pilot seat. Every time they move it around, they risk breaking the back of the pilot seat, and that results in the pilot not being able to safely fly the aircraft. So in all situations, ultimately make sure that customers and skydivers alike are not grabbing the back of the pilot seat. For the exit from your knees, uh, again, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, I've seen some instructors just put one foot onto the step, hands on the door frame on the front and the back, and push themselves out, not worrying about what the student's legs are doing. I've also seen people have the student take both of their feet and hang them outside of the airplane, or put them on the step as well, and then dive to the back of the aircraft. Again, my personal preference is to be seated in the aircraft, connected, left foot out, customer's feet out dangling behind the step and exiting towards the back of the airplane. Uh, please feel free to direct message me or put up your hand if that uh, wasn't an adequate answer or if I, I didn't make sense in, in any point. I see uh, Richard Sloan here has his hand up. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask you to unmute and have you chime in here if you would like. Hey, Nick, uh, thanks a lot. Coming from down at uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. And it's a different uh, question entirely, so I apologize. Uh, the question I have is that uh, I travel about 280 days out of the year to various states and overseas uh, for the military. And we do military jumps in very cold conditions. However, when we take civilians uh, on a tandem jump, we kind of enacted like a certain temperature on the ground. Does any drop zones in the north do things like that? Like, for instance, for some of our, the civilians, it, it's got to be at least 32 degrees Fahrenheit on the ground. Do you, you have any kind of standard like that in the north? Uh, I can only speak from my limited experience. Uh, I've been jumping for 19 years now. Uh, I have landed in snow. I have not done tandems in such cold weather. Um, when I was a, a more junior skydiver, I certainly was more than happy to jump in uh, garbage cold weather, uh, but I'm a fair weather skydiver now. I don't even like to jump if it's too windy. Um, that said, I think there are a lot of other uh, Northern uh, North America and maybe even some Northern European people uh, well, and anywhere, I mean, lots of places get, get cold and snow and still jump. So if anybody else wants to chime in and uh, give their two cents on, on that question, then by all means. Um, but my experience, especially over the last 10 years, is quite limited. 
uh, although I do know that there are some drop zones in Canada that stay open throughout the winter. We're sissies. So for us, uh, for Scott I Vancouver, we live in Western on the West Coast. We're the Hawaii of Canada. Um, it, it was like, I don't know, 18 degrees or something today. Um, Celsius. Celsius, yes, sorry. Um, but, you know, my husband and I, I we're kind of, I don't know, maybe it's because we're old now, but um, I don't find it a pleasant experience for our tandems, um, for our customers, if they're in balaclavas and you know, we want them to land and be like, that was awesome. Not, oh my God, I'm so cold. I can't feel my fingers, but that's our personal decision. There are other drop zones, uh, definitely in Canada um, that run all year. And, and we have taken a tandem in the middle of January with snow, um, but it's freaking like minus 25 degrees Celsius or whatever that is in Fahrenheit. It's cold. So that that's our personal decision as DZOs. I don't know if anyone else is like, I don't know, like Chicago, anyone here, New York, you guys have cold weather. What do you do, John? Anyone else? Um, my boss, if it's not above freezing on the ground, he doesn't want to fly the plane. Like, I've, we, you know, there's days where we push the plane out of the hangar to like let it sit in the sun for a little bit to get the ice off it and then go jump. But like, he also doesn't want the gear in the snow. So we like once that kind of weather hits, he's like, yeah, it's diminishing returns. And for like the handful of people that want to do a tandem, he's like, yeah, come back in March or April. Um, I've done some really cold ones. I just hide behind them. Like I had a girl once is like, I'm like, it's going to be super cold. She's like, I know. I'm like, no, you don't. And like, it was stupid cold. And she was like, man, that sucks. And I was like, I tell you so no like once at a certain point like it's just not fun so I mean I'll still do it because I'm here but uh yeah I don't need to be dealing super cold tandems anymore thanks guys is this where we're all like frowning at our Mexico friends that are on this call I don't know if our Mexico people are still on here <laughs> but uh yeah good question though I like that they actually have an actual number it's like a wind number right it's like an actual temperature and i'm sorry today is minus whatever anyone else have any questions cool things to talk about just to go back to the 182 oh, question I oh sorry a couple people had sorry nick someone in norway says they do jumps uh in way too cold weather in norway that's their comment yeah, but in Norway, they're way stronger than we are. Exactly right. Uh, Evan and, and the other people that asked about uh, 182 exits. Um, did I answer the questions that you had? Sorry, the chat's gone, gone on a little bit there. And I want to make sure that I didn't miss something in your questions. Just a reminder to everyone, you have the ability to unmute yourself. You don't need to wait for my permission or anything. You can just hit unmute. Well, on that note, I, I think that if no one has anything else to add, uh, for several of you, it's uh, there's already one guy who left because they're jumping. It's like jump time. Uh, it's bedtime almost over here for us. Um, again, I can't thank uh, all of you guys enough. I know there's there's um, amazingly like 37 people still on this. We had entire DZs come out here. Uh, onto this call today. I hope to see many of you if you are uh, interested in some of uh, the other topics we'll be having. By all means, I invite you if you know people who uh, are wingsuiters or advanced canopy pilots or riggers, um, by all means, I'll get that information out. I have also said it in here. Um, I will be sending everyone else an email. I will make sure that uh, Erica and Nick and I work together to any links that we've talked to or referred to. I'll make sure they're sent in that and it looks like my recording actually recorded this whole thing. I'm seeing the record light. 
Unfortunately, I had technical issues last time. So I will send a link out to the recording as well. Um, I hope you can all come up to Canada one day, the west coast of Canada, the best coast of Canada, and uh, come visit us at Skydive Vancouver Island. I hope one day I get to see all of you, be it at Boogies or your drop zones. Um, and Nick, thank you so much. I didn't really get to thank you either. Uh, you were instrumental in creating this and to the wonderful Erica. Um, mum life, looks what how look what happens, right? Oh, us parents. <laughs> yeah, sorry guys, Erica's still still trying to get Annalise down for bed, but um, All good. Uh, she says good night and thank you to everybody for joining in. Um, Allison, if I could, I I did uh, get a message here from from someone suggesting that the the part of the 182 question I didn't cover was sure. how to not like do a front flip as you exited the airplane. Um, and in my experience, uh, the key, especially with a, a dive towards the back of the airplane, um, is I think the best way for me to describe it is to think about um, diving up, if that makes sense. So you're going, like if you were to, as you leave the airplane, of course, feet on your butt and hands out as far as you can in front of you, grabbing as much air as you can. Um, trying to dive at or above the tail. Uh, now, I've, I've never met anybody that could launch themselves far enough to actually be able to reach the tail. Um, so your mileage may vary, but in my experience, I've not been able to do that. Um, but I found that by trying to go up, of course, without hitting the back of the wing or the, the flap, um, going up and allowing the passenger to pull you down into as you fall into the relative wind um, gives you a better chance of not doing a front flip as you leave the 182 with a, a diving exit towards the tail. So try to think about it in that sense as going rather than diving down, think about it as going up or at the tail and letting the passenger's weight pull you down and you'll naturally rotate probably a little bit head low regardless but you shouldn't flip over. If anyone wants to keep talking, go ahead. And if you need to leave, you're, believe me, lots of left too, so. I've rather enjoyed people's profile pics on here. Her is it Harold? Your profile yeah. pic is awesome. You look like an actor. Okay. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a question because uh, if I'm not mistaken, the UPT says that when you disconnect from, um, from the seatbelt uh, after takeoff, you should uh, connect the shoulder harness and then keep them on and then uh, connect the side uh, when you prepare for exit. Is that something that people do or have I mistaken what UPT has said at some point? Uh, because I, when I sit in a plane, I would rather have only the side connected because it's uh, better to sit in a plane than actually having the, the shoulder harness as you could. Has anyone any input or what their routines are? UPT actually says that after the seatbelt comes off, you should put on the lowers and then you can put on at least one upper if someone is getting out of the plane, like if someone's doing a hop and pop or somebody's exiting, uh, then you can hook up at least one upper, if not both. Once the jumper is out of the plane, you can unhook the uppers if you want to until it is time to go through your hookup procedure. Uh, what they actually want taught um, cause I was just did my examiner rating down with Tom Noonan last month is when you are teaching instructors, what they want is for you to then disconnect the lowers and reconnect the lowers and then hook, hook up the uppers all in one motion. So basically building the, um, procedure of hooking up one, two, three, four hooks all at the same time when you're getting your, your passenger ready to go. Uh, but they say it's not really outlined that you have to hook up the lowers once the seatbelt is off, but it is a good practice. But they also want it taught that when you are hooking up at nine or 10,000 feet or whenever you're hooking up, you should disconnect the lowers and have your student or whoever 
not your student, your candidate, if you were being an examiner, hook up the bottom and then hook up the top left and the top right, tighten up the bottoms and then go through your procedure from there. Uh, the only thing they had said was that they want at least one upper hooked up if someone is exiting the aircraft. Something to add to, I and mean, it's a perfect description, John. Uh, I had Tom down at Fort Bragg not long ago, and he said the reason why, Harold, that they're having them do this in this new, newer fashion was because they've seen in the field that quite a few instructors had forgotten to hook up the uppers. They've either done some circle around, go around, and I, I, I agree with them that complacency is the demon of us after we had a long day, 20, 25 tandems, and then we get tired on that last few, maybe you did a go around because of an ATC hold. And that is the reason I, I believe that uh, Noonan was getting that with it. And I hope that helps to hone in uh, the importance of it as well. Nice job, John. I was also gonna, uh... Just invite anyone if anyone wants to talk about the camera hand cam um, things. I do know that we have uh, a rigger on here as well who has made some for us. Brian Murray's on the call. So if anyone has any questions about the hand cam, what are they called? Sorry, I'm not a tandem instructor. I just know that it's yellow and you pull it and I lose my GoPro. That's what I know about it. So, but if anyone has any questions, Brian Murray uh, is also on this call right now, and I'm sure would be willing to chat with anybody about that. Well, it doesn't seem like there's much conversation left. So, uh, Erica, you're back and we're going to leave now. Thanks. Thanks, Erica, for doing such an awesome job. No, uh, Erica, again, thank you so much. Um, I think that's it. I hope everyone has a fantastic night, has a fantastic season. Uh, I know Erica has opened herself. If you have any questions that you think about afterwards, please feel free to contact Erica directly. And, um, oh, and of course, sorry. Uh, and of course, if uh, you have any questions you want to direct to Skydive Vancouver Island, we can make sure that get the answers as well. That's it. All right. Well, thanks, guys. <laughs> I think that's it. No thanks one. Has to... Thank you. Ah, be safe, everyone. Thank you so thanks, much, everybody. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. Have a good night. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Sure.